Hello, I am Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. Tensions on the rise between Uganda and Rwanda. A border closure reaches its seventh day, and now Rwanda accuses Uganda of supporting rebel groups. Battling Ebola, we look at the challenges in tackling the disease in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We opened the body bag and performed rituals on my mother's body. The medics warned us against it. They said she had died from Ebola, but we refused to believe them. The streets are empty. Thousands of Sudanese have heeded a call for a general strike, the latest protest against President Omar al-Bashir. Also on the program, being 17. We hear about the life, hopes and aspirations of one young man in Senegal. And in sports, it's the return of the European Champions League and there's something playing on the mind of the Spurs manager ahead of their clash. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Tensions have been building between Uganda and Rwanda for some months as both countries accuse each other of spying. This rift escalated quickly last week after Rwanda closed the border with its neighbor, preventing Ugandan trucks and people from entering. They've also accused Ugandan authorities of detaining, torturing and illegally deporting its citizens. And today the situation between both countries deteriorated even further. Rwanda's foreign minister accused Uganda of supporting rebel groups opposed to President Paul Kagame's government. Well, our reporter Catherine Biaruhanga is at the border crossing for us now. Uh, Catherine, there's been some heated rhetoric coming from politicians on both sides. Tell us more about the accusations. Well, what um, stands at the heart of these accusations is that there's a feeling from Rwanda that the Ugandan government might be working to destabilize the government in Chigali. And that's where we saw the words from the foreign minister today saying that Uganda is harboring rebel groups uh, linked to the opposition politician Kayumba Nyamwasa. They also accuse the government here in Uganda of arbitrarily arresting their citizens, torturing some of them and then deporting them back home. The Ugandan government released a statement today categorically denying these allegations but over the past year, two years we've seen a lot of tensions and these border um, disruptions are really an escalation of the diplomatic row between the two countries. Uh, meanwhile, Rwanda is still keeping its border with Uganda closed, uh, Catherine. Uh, what's the impact on, on, on the people in that area? Well, there are three key border crossings between Uganda and Rwanda. The first at Mirama Hills, then Katuna, and where we are at Chanika. What's happened here at Chanika is there are no Rwandans coming into Uganda. Um, there are trucks that, uh, that originate from Uganda not being allowed to cross um, into Rwanda. At Katuna, that border is practically shut. Um, only small vehicles are allowed to get through. The, what the Rwandan government has allowed to happen is for most of the cargo traffic to go through the third border, which is Murama. But that's a longer distance to get to Chigali. It takes longer time, costs more money. So traders on the Ugandan side really see this as some kind of uh, penalty from the government in Chigali. And presumably there is a knock-on effect on surrounding countries. Yes, what uh, Uganda offers is really a route not only to Rwanda but onto Eastern DRC, specifically the big town of Goma, and then to Burundi as well. Today we actually met a Kenyan truck driver who'd been stuck. He couldn't take his uh, petrol tanker from Kenya through Uganda, Rwanda, and then onto Eastern Congo. So he's had to spend seven days in limbo. That costs more money for businesses. It means that customers are not able to get goods on time and for the moment the hope is that these these border disruptions don't last too long and have a, a, a knock-on effect on consumers in the countries in the region okay Catherine Beruhanka in Chanika on the border between Rwanda and Uganda thank you very much at least 560 people have died and close to 900 others have been infected by Ebola following the largest outbreak of the disease in the Democratic Republic of the Congo 
The BBC's senior Africa correspondent, Anne Soy, has been looking at the conditions that made infections spread far and fast in the eastern DRC, uh, DRC's city of Beni. Ebola hit this village hard. This family lost 10 members in a matter of weeks. But Rochelle and her sister survived. She tells me they were all in denial when the outbreak started. We opened the body bag and performed rituals on my mother's body. The medics warned us against it. They said she had died from Ebola, but we refused to believe them. We told them she died from food poisoning. Then they tried to persuade us to get vaccinated, but we refused. This has been a major test for the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's dealt with nine previous outbreaks, mostly in remote villages in the West where they were easily contained. In a country as big as Western Europe, but with poor infrastructure, few knew about Ebola in the East. Even doctors who treated the first cases failed to recognize it. After a week, I started feeling unwell. I had a headache, fever after two days, I started vomiting and having diarrhea. Even at that point, I didn't know what I was suffering from. Not even my colleagues who are treating me suspected Ebola. That's why health facilities became Ebola hotspots. It was worse in informal clinics where the majority of Congolese seek health services. They are called Tradimodern and they are run by untrained practitioners. We can't close this clinic, right, just because the person is not uh, trained. He's an integral part of the healthcare system, or the health continuum in this community. So what we need to do is leverage the fact that he's already here, build his capacity in one way or the other, so that he can provide safer care than he's already doing. A confirmed case of Ebola was treated here. The traditional healer continued to use the same equipment on other patients. Now, everything has to be decontaminated or destroyed. It's now safe to come to this clinic, this community leader assures the villagers. As well as prevent Ebola from spreading, it's important to deal with the ignorance that fueled it in the first place. This is an impromptu classroom in the middle of the village, and many of them like these are happening in different parts of eastern Congo. Health workers are going to villages, to different residential areas, and talking to people about Ebola. He's been asking these children what they know about the disease and teaching them how they can prevent infection. Back at the clinic, destroyed items are replaced. It can now continue to function, but not deal with Ebola. Suspected cases must now go to specialized treatment centers. Dr. Mutunga and Rochelle were treated here, and they are now back to help. Being survivors, they are now immune and are giving back, even as the outbreak continues. Anne Soy, BBC News, Beni. And tomorrow, Anne Soy will be looking at why fighting Ebola in a war zone has made this the most complex outbreak ever. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa. The Islamic State group has reportedly replaced its leader in its West African affiliate known as Islamic State West Africa province. Nigerian journalist Ahmad Salkida, generally seen as an expert on the group, claims Abu Musab al-Barnawi has been sacked by IS just over two years after he was named as the leader of a splinter group of Nigeria's main jihadist group Boko Haram. U.S. President Donald Trump has extended sanctions against Zimbabwe by a year, saying the new government's policies continue to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the American foreign policy. Officials say the sanctions will remain until Zimbabwe's laws restricting media freedom and protests are changed. South African star Mandla Mampincha Mapumolo has been arrested after video appearing to show him assaulting his musician girlfriend was posted on her Instagram page at the weekend. The clip, uh, the clip of him attacking Bongukile Similani, known by her stage name Babes Wodumo, was shared widely and sparked outrage. He is currently in police custody and is due to appear in court.
and a second patient is free of HIV after receiving stem cell treatment for cancer. The London-based patient has been in remission for 18 months and is no longer taking HIV drugs. The virus is no longer detectable, but researchers say it is too early to say the patient is cured of HIV. The streets of Sudan were empty today as a nationwide general strike is underway. It's the latest protest against President Omar al-Bashir. Demonstrators coordinated by an umbrella group of professionals began 10 weeks ago, sparked by cuts to food subsidies. They've gathered momentum and the protesters have been calling for the long-serving president to step down. Well, Ahmed Soleiman is a senior researcher with the Africa program at Chatham House, and he joins us now. Ahmad, we're talking about empty streets in Khartoum and Omdurman. Was, was this a success for the protesters? Uh, the protesters are claiming it to be a success and, and saying that thousands of people uh, participated in this nationwide strike, you know, pro from professionals to those not making very much money, uh, abstaining from working, uh, go not going out onto the streets, uh, holding up placards, calling for uh, the government and the president to, to be removed, and, and saying that this is an agenda that is going to continue for the foreseeable future until their demands are met. How much pressure does this add on President Omar al-Bashir? Because we saw within the last few days, you know, he's given some ground, handing over the leadership of the ruling party to his deputy. But does this increase pressure on him to step down? I think it depends on how you analyse it. I mean, he's given the acting chairmanship of the party to a very close ally, uh, former governor of North Kordofan. Uh, some could say that he's holding that post warm for President Bashir for, for, for the future, for when he might decide to run again in a future election. So he's kind of postponed that bit for the time being. Um, I think the government will be concerned about the protests and the, and the president will be. I think their actions in, in, in kind of implementing a state of uh, emergency and a security crackdown in the country show that both internal and, and situation within the party and the protests are having an effect on them and they, and they want to uh, maintain control the, the best way that they know how and and we're seeing that they're also trying to reach out to opposition groups to youth and others and and bring them in for dialogue and extended national dialogue uh, but it remains to be seen how they go about that with the restrictions on freedoms restrictions on freedom of assembly and and, and speech uh, and people being detained uh, we've seen some opposition leaders released uh, particularly notable one on monday but we, we are yet to see how this is, you know, going to play itself out. And is it surprising that regionally leaders in neighbouring states have been very quiet about what's happening in Sudan? Is it that they, they don't want to take on Omar al-Bashir or they're worried about the consequences of supporting him if the protesters do succeed? I think there's, a, there's certainly an element of both. And there's a, been a lot of shuttle diplomacy between uh, people from both governments to to capitals like Cairo to Doha uh, you know Saudi Arabia and and the UAE and I think that's that's a, a critical concern is is receiving that backing the, uh, the president will certainly want to have backing and, and balance those neighboring countries I think with a with a militarized government you can see that he's probably reaching out to the likes of Egypt to Saudi Arabia and the UAE but also by maintaining some loyalists from the Islamist group within the party. I think he'll also be trying to, to, to say to the Qataris, for example, that we are, you know, we are still allies and, and continue to support me. Okay. Ahmed Soliman from Chatham House, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll still have you back on the program to talk about this further. Thank, thank you very much. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, Mimi with the sports as we catch up with the ongoing Zambia football, uh, outgoing Zambia football coach about the challenges of his job. And Peter Kwacha, the top stories this are. A row between Uganda and Rwanda escalates, with Rwanda accusing Uganda of supporting rebel groups as a border closure has reached its seventh day. Nigeria has the highest number of women entrepreneurs in the world. 40% of women have their own businesses, but there are still so many barriers to success, including access to finance and traditional attitudes. Investment banker Tony Sani wants to help women in the diaspora 
to be part of the solution. She's been in London for the first meeting of the Ni Women in Finance Nigeria group. Lebu Diseko asked her what changes she would like to see. We want to see more women represented in the boards of companies. Um, one of the initiatives that I'm passionate about is to advocate for companies to have a minimum representation, ideally, of one third of their board comprised of women. Secondly, is more women in senior executive positions, more female CEOs, and the third initiative will be to support female entrepreneurs as well. When you arrived, we were talking about uh, the comments that Muhammad Ubahari made about his wife, where she belongs, uh, according to him. Certainly that kind of attitude must concern you. Those are very painful comments, but I also believe that um, power is never served on a plate of, on a plate of gold, plate of gold. I think the only way to prove that you're ready for something is to go out there and, and take it and demand for it. It's painful that women are forced in some situations to, as it were, play the game according to the rules set by men. But I think women should change the game. Something I didn't know is Nigeria actually has the highest number of uh, female entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, why do you think that is? Many of the challenges that we face in life are there actually to make us better people. So um, being in a community that has almost 200 million people struggling for resources that are inadequate, being forced to be the breadwinner in a lot of cases, and also at the same time the caregiver, I guess it has brought out the fighter in, in our women. And, and to some extent that is good for us. A lot of those businesses will be small businesses, but there are also women that have larger enterprises. What help would you like to see for those women? Access to finance, um, more um, policies that encourage small and medium scale enterprises. And the statistics show that women find it harder to access funding, to access capital, both equity and debt capital, because unfortunately the decision makers take them through hoops that they don't take male entrepreneurs through. Um, it, those are the kind of, of course education is very important, that's a bedrock of everything. So policies that will ensure that our girls can access quality education and be safe in school and stay in school and be given the same level you know, of um, education as their male, um, siblings are given. Those are the things that will help us. You're watching BBC Focus in Africa. It's now time for some sports. Mimi, Champions League football? Lots of football today on the show, Peter. Thank you very much. European Champions League kicks off a little later. It's the second leg of the last 16. There are two matches to look out for today. Real Madrid will be hosting Ajax. They come into the match with a 2-1 advantage. And the other game sees Tottenham playing away to Borussia Dortmund. They take a 3-0 lead into the game. But Spurs manager Maurizio Pochettino has urged the English FA and the English Premier League to do more to help their home clubs when playing in Europe's elite competition. They played on Saturday and are playing today. And Pochettino is unhappy with not being given as much preparation time as their opponents. And it's strange for me that no one say nothing about that. Eh? Sorry, because the first leg was, was the same. And the, now the second leg... Is, is the same. Of course, that tomorrow we are going to to fight and give our best. But again, I think it's impossible in this type of game, uh, last 16. How important is the is the game uh, that one team have 24 hours more than another to prepare the game? I think it's massive, massive. Now, kidnappers have released the mother of Nigeria International and Bordeaux's Samuel Kalu, who was abducted six days ago. But authorities have confirmed that she was freed on Monday. Mrs. Juliet Kalu was abducted in her car whilst making her way home in the southeastern city of Abia State. Police say that an investigation is ongoing. On Monday, Super Eagles coach Gernot Rohr included Kalu in his list of 21 invited players for Nigeria's upcoming Africa Cup of Nations qualifier against Seychelles and a friendly with Egypt later this month. 
Cardiff City and Ivory Coast International Soul Bamba has been ruled out for the rest of the season after damaging knee ligaments. The 34-year-old was forced off the field during Cardiff's 2-0 defeat to Wolves in the English Premier League over the weekend. The defenders also a big doubt for the upcoming Africa Cup of Nations this summer. Bamba ruptured his cruciate knee ligament and now needs surgery. And finally, last week we told you the contract of the outgoing Zambia coach Sven van der Broek will not be renewed when it expires at the end of this month. The FA said it was for failing to qualify for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations, which I said kicks off this summer. But the Belgian, who was assistant coach to Hugo Bruce when Cameroon won the tournament in 2017, told the BBC that working in the country had its challenges. On the football side, it was tough. Uh, I have to say that the Zambian football landscape is quite divided. What makes it tough? Well, let's say the, the environment where I came in, uh, although it was presented as, as beautiful and, and having a lot of ambition, it's quite political. Uh, political based on um, status, self-protection, uh, even not too much taking responsibilities and it was hard to find my way through it, uh, to, to find a balance to do my job as good as possible. And that's all the sport. Back to you, Peter. Many thanks, Mimi. Now here on Focus on Africa, we've been looking at the lives of 17-year-olds from around the continent, their hopes, dreams and frustrations. Abdullahi lives in Dakar, the capital of Senegal. Friends, family and faith are all important to him, but he also wants to make his mark on the world. Here's his story. Assalamu alaikum. Man, mangi tu de Abdullahi Wad. Mangi dek Yambal, fi ti Dakar, fi Senegal. Je parle également le le français parce que c'est c'est notre langue officielle. Et le Wolof, c'est notre langue nationale. And uh, I also speak English because it is an international language. There is no way you may feel yourself better than at home. And the reason why kids from my area, they every time success at school, or they get good results. And it is thanks to the things that the parents are doing, I mean the education they are giving, Everybody is going to correct you and tell you about how you should do. It is that kind of solidarity in the education that makes us um, in that situation. I am 17, but most of the time, me and my friends, we, they don't understand me. Miss, what is, her, what is your name? When we are gathered, we're discussing and playing, I just say, yesterday this thing happened, the president has done this or that. How do you find it? They tell me, how? You're killing us with your information. The most important thing in my life is my religion. For the future, I, first I would like to, to be among those who are going to take this country, work for this country, and trying to make it move forward. Good for him. Just before we go, an update on the story we brought to you earlier. South African star Mandla Mampincha Mapumulo has been released on bail after earlier being charged for assaulting his girlfriend, Bongekile Similane, known by the stage name Babes Wodumo. Don't forget, you can get in touch with me and the team on Twitter. I'm at Okwache. But for today, from me, Peter Okwache, and the rest of the Focus in Africa team, thanks for watching. Goodbye.